Hello and welcome to the 1100 Project with me, Stuart White. This is episode three. I wanted to start off today by saying a massive, humongous thanks to everyone who has listened to the first two episodes. The tweets and messages that I've had about about those episodes and about the, the announcement and so on in general have have been a bit overwhelming and but but at the same time um it's it's yeah it's been it's, it's been a wee bit emotional actually to be honest getting such a a supportive and kind uh, response from people um I didn't I, I certainly didn't expect anything on, on this scale um, my 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 friends who have told in a sort of behind the scenes over the last five or six months and the people who have told my first couple of newsletters as well have have been have been amazing but I, I didn't really expect it to go too far beyond that sphere and yeah I just wanted to start off this episode by saying a humongous thanks to everyone so far it really means a lot when people like tweet about the the podcast or they tweet support or they you know they they, they email me or they message me to say something uh, if you if you're listening and um, you want to support me or to support the podcast or whatever, these things really really help the the word of mouth passing on um, that there's there's something like this out there that people can tune into and learn a bit more about uh, this side and this pathway for for publishing. So yeah, make sure you, you keep um, talking about it and and keep on uh, letting others know even even if you don't um, feel comfortable doing it. On social media you can certainly let people know via your facebook groups or twitter dms or or whatever other means you happen to to pass on uh, news about this kind of thing so yes thank you all very much um, i wanted to get that out of the way first because actually the the podcast although it's, it's a little bit for me um i think if someone says it's, com- it's completely non-self um serving then they're probably not telling the truth there's a, there's a degree of um therapy and uh, self-serving nature to to me doing the podcast that it's good for me to note down my thoughts and feelings every week and the things that I've done the things I've achieved and the things that I'm working towards that's that's all to my benefit and obviously the the benefit for all of you guys is is getting to to hear about it because I know that over the the last year six months when I've been really getting a bit more razor sharp focused upon this uh, particular project that reading about watching videos podcasts doing courses and I'm going to talk a little bit about courses later on and and such things have really really benefited my, my knowledge base for going through this process and it's one of those things self-publishing where when you first consider it it, it, it almost seems impossible because there's so many things to take into account and it's like any task that has lots and lots of moving parts at first it just looks impossible it's sort of like uh, in you know in the labyrinth movie when david bowie's moving uh, you know the staircases around and she she can't find her way to to her brother and <laughs> yeah it's, it's basically like that at the start and and it seems like an impossible task to ever get there but if you just sort of knock them out one at a time you, you know you spend a lot of time reading a lot of time researching things uh, as I have done, um, then it, it certainly helps and it makes things a bit clearer and you eventually get there. But as I say, what I'm hoping from this podcast is that I make that just a little bit easier for the next person. And in turn, someone else you know, down the line will continue to do that uh, for, for other people who are considering this option. Because the, the great thing about it is you're not really in competition with other writers. And I know that some people might disagree with me and they might say, well, there's only a a finite number of publishing deals or there's blah 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 there's only a finite uh, space in the shelf and that's probably true for for trad publishing but if you're going down the self-publishing route there is definitely plenty of room for all and it's certainly a, a good mantra to have is to think okay how can I, I pull up all those alongside me how can I help others and then when you when you do that to people and this, this is human nature they they want to reciprocate. They want to help back. They there are very few parasitic humans, 
<laughs> and and I mean and I mean that in the uh, in the, the less biological sense of the word. There are very few people who will just take, 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 take and give nothing back. And I actually think that the, the less people just give back altruistically, or at least mutualistically, the the less warm and full of support and love this this world is. So it's important that that we continue to do that, pass it on. You know, not, knowledge is not supposed to be stored by a select few people. It's supposed to be passed on to others, and that's that's human nature. That's how we've evolved is passing on that sur- survival knowledge over the the ages and. Now, you know, it's, it's not survival knowledge unless, you know, you're like me and, and writing stories as your life um, and you can't possibly survive without it. Then, yes, we've got to keep passing on the on the, the knowledge that we that we uh, attain ourselves. So, yes, let's get started with today's podcast then, because uh, we're already a few minutes in and I've yet to really get to the, the business of the podcast. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more today about a few things. First of all, the emotional side of making the choice to self-publish, because that, that that is a huge a huge element for people. Is once once you've actually made the choice, and then you're doing all the things that you need to do. That's that's a different uh, mentality. But actually getting over that, I'm gonna I was gonna say hurdle to choose to self-publish, but it's it's not so much a hurdle. It's it's getting out of your own way a little bit, getting out of your own head or. Uh, getting away from what you've heard other people say about about the process, uh, and and getting over that, and making the choice that, that is is quite a hard thing to do. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what my th- thought process was during that particular uh, period. I'm also going to talk about the impact of doing this on on the people around me. Um, what kind of things are are going through my head as I'm doing all of these things? Uh, talk a little bit about. Um, approaching people and asking people to be part of it because with self-publishing obviously you don't have people doing those things for you uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about ego and confidence and proving yourself um, and we're also then going to talk a little bit more about logistical stuff like for example cover stuff and edits and uh, self-publishing courses that are available as well um, and some of the things that I'm, I'm working on at the moment towards uh, my own uh, self-published book so that's the the rundown of the show which I'll, I'll post in the wee caption below just if you want to have a quick look at what's coming up so let's start with the the emotional side of making the choice to self-publish now one thing I always do and I pride myself in this and I'll continue to do this is I'll be completely honest I think that that is the the number one marker of uh, a person who is at ease is to to be completely honest. I think the more or yeah, the more we don't reveal and we hold things back and we're not completely honest, the more we have baggage to carry around with us that that um untruthful baggage because we're we're cons- our mind is constantly saying I- I've now got this thing that I've not been completely true about, and so I have to remember both what the truth is and what the the slight dishonest way in which I've just said that is, and if you if you continue your life like that, always with a little sort of dishonest narrative as, as well as an honest narrative running parallel, it's really hard to to remember the difference between the two at times, and you can get yourself into a lot of trouble and um and and really get yourself in knots if you if you can't keep those two uh, narratives separate. So yeah, for me, complete honesty is the way to go. You you do that and you it's hard for you to uh, contradict yourself or get yourself into notes, although um, I'll probably still manage to to do that at some point. So I have a confession. Uh, when I started first writing novels and sending them out, I thought traditional publishing would be easier. I thought within a few years that I'd get picked up and one of my books would be published and I thought getting an agent would be easier. I thought the acquisitions process and so on would be easier. I thought basically almost every aspect of traditional publishing would be easier than it actually is. I was very naive at the time. There was less information on the internet about uh, 
people sharing you know their journeys how difficult it is and so on you, you just saw those who had been published and what they said on their blog posts whatever at that point and when when things were it's not that people were dishonest but the the journeys of people who are successful seem sometimes quite easy they don't they don't have the same bumps in the road that like you and i for example might have had over the years um and and so therefore when you're reading about that and you think oh well, everyone i've read about has uh, sent their first book to agents and been signed up and then they've gone out and uh, and you know sold their book to publishers and so on when that's all you read you think it is easier than it actually is and that's why i'm enjoying this era that we're in of people being more honest and sharing the the sides that aren't as um social media friendly and where it's not just all about good announcements and a, a smooth easy path and and of course that's what i've i've, I've st- striven to do for a long time now and i know that people do appreciate that and you know the more the more that people share that the the easier it becomes for other people to follow and to also share it and that that's part of the the mission part of the task is to to amplify the the honest side of of how difficult and how tricky it is with traditional publishing so yeah i thought it was going to be easier <laughs> and i've got to be honest when um rejections come in then it's the next book and then all the rejections come in the next book and so on i was thinking why am i not getting picked up you know they're, and, and of course my, my writing at that point w- was not as strong as it is now i didn't understand or have as great a uh, craft knowledge i didn't have ha- have as much sp- experience of of reading as widely as I have since then um, in the middle grade and YA space. And yeah, I, I think I was probably, oh, in, in fact, definitely very naive. There's the uh, Dunning-Kruger curve, I think it's called, that it's the one to do with um, knowledge and confidence or on the, the two axes of the graph. And at the start of the graph, when you're very low in knowledge, you're quite high in confidence because you you don't know what you don't know if that makes sense. So you don't know that it's going to be so difficult. You don't know that most people get rejected. You don't know that, you know, the majority of people send three, four, five novels or take, you know, five to 10 to 20 years before they they get picked up by anyone. So, and, and, and they call it, it's not a very nice name, but they, they call it the, being at the, the peak of Mount Stupid. And I think I, I spent a long time there, to be honest, <laughs> uh, just sort of thinking, oh, why is this not happening? Why is this not happening? And then of course, uh, I spent a lot of time, you know, in the sort of mid uh, teens, twenty thirteen, fourteen through to twenty seventeen, eighteen. I spent a lot of time then uh, looking at things in a bit more detail. Obviously, learning craft stuff. I, you know, I did a masters, I did lots of courses and so on. Uh, basically, improved my writing craft uh, by a considerable amount at that time. But also became more aware of uh, what what the actual um, industries like what the statistics are like for people making it and um, all these kind of things and and that um that extra knowledge took me from where I was at the you know the peak of confidence with little knowledge it took me right down to the bottom of the inverted bell curve on that particular graph so I was at um sort of a mid range or maybe a, a little bit higher in a mid range knowledge and my confidence was very very low and I've I've, I've been trying to sort of climb that next that next hill the the second part of the inverted bell shape curve and you know where it starts to rise up again towards confidence and that's at the point where your knowledge reaches mastery now i'm i'm certainly not uh, confident or um again using the word naive enough to think that i'm i'm anywhere close to mastery but i um, i think i'm probably and the competence to slightly beyond competence range now i'm trying to climb that hill and actually it's the hardest part of the the journey for me anyway is is climbing this particular uh, part and, and getting from um having a good bit of knowledge to uh to, to mastery of, of 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 craft and knowledge about the industry and so on um, and I'm, I'm certainly not there yet and i'm i'm working my way up towards that but i, I can feel my, my confidence rising a little bit from from what it was back then uh, i'm i'm a bit more aware of what i don't know now i know what i don't know uh unlike before when i didn't know what i didn't know so by knowing what you don't know you can then obviously work towards it and and try and learn that stuff and 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 get that within your uh, knowledge base 
So yeah, that, that, I, I thought it'd be easier than it was, and it, it's been really hard. And um, that has been a, a factor, obviously, in, in my decision to to publish my books myself. Will I completely and forever give up on traditional publishing? I don't think so because there's a lot of merit to it. There's a lot of advantages to to going down that route. So it's not a never say um, I'll never do it, but it's a not for now. I'm going to uh, try this different route because I, 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 a, I'm excited to do it. It's, it's something that, and, that, and that we're talking about the emotional side of it, but I am very excited to do this. It's it's learning something new as well. It's not just uh, writing a book, which you know the traditional side is, and um, and then you know making that the very best it can be, and then working with your editors and so on, um, and not being as involved in some of the the other aspects, uh, because obviously people at the the publisher do that. You have a lot more to do um, on this side, but it's it's learning all about that, and and I, I'm really enjoying it so far. So yeah, as as much as I thought the traditional publishing route would be easier than it was, and it was really tough, um, I wouldn't rule it out forever. So when I made the decision to self-publish, and I actually, you know, my friends will know this, I, I hummed and hawed for a while. I went back and forth. Uh, I'd created a business plan for it, uh, you know, like with like one, three, five, and ten-year targets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because that's that is how I'm a little bit extra like that. I like to uh, put numbers into spreadsheets and type in formulas and let my wild side run free. Um, it's like a non-stop party with me and my spreadsheets in my, my wee office every evening. But I I did that and, and I was ready, I think, you know, from the, that point of view to do it. But I don't think I was ready emotionally to do it. Um, and, and I, yeah, as I say, I hummed and hawed for a long time. I kept thinking things, and this is, this is bad, but I kept thinking all the old things, you know, like, oh, it, it feels like I've given up and I shouldn't do this and so on. But the second I made the decision to do it, and and part of the making the decision to do it is actually telling someone that you're going to do it as well. But well, for me anyway, I I'm not very good. If I just make a decision myself and don't tell anyone, sometimes it won't happen. I can lack self discipline on tasks where I am only doing it for me, or I've only told myself about it. As soon as I am accountable to other people and I've said it to other people, I I switch on. And, I, and as I said in the last episode, I'm an all or nothing personality type. So I will um, absolutely go for it once I know that that is what I'm going to do. So I, I, I was very excited. I was switched on once I'd made the decision. Uh, I uh, started reading everything I could. Like I'd been reading things before that, but I was consuming everything I could. Every uh, And I did a few courses, which I'm going to talk about later on, and read a, a couple of books as well. And it all just started building up the excitement. But then I had another thought at that point, and that was about other people. So I'd been thinking about myself when I decided to self-publish because I wanted to publish the book and get it out to young readers. Um, and and I, that was the only way that I thought I was, I was, I'm going to be able to do that. So, but then I started thinking about my family. Um, I have two kids uh, who are quite young. Um, my, my wife's just finishing a, a degree at university. Um, so we... Um, we haven't had much money for the last couple of years, unfortunately, um, because she's been a student and uh, I've had to re- reduce my teaching hours a wee bit just because uh, basically childcare costs are the equivalent of um, working a day's work and it's, you, you have to make those choices in life. Do I go to work for the day and you know make 10 quid or do I stay at home with my child for the day? And, you know, and sometimes there's not really a decision to be made there. Um, and yeah, so there's, it's been quite difficult for us um, financially over the last couple of years. And then uh, me deciding to do this is obviously going to involve finance because, you know, I mean, you can stick, you can obviously just stick your manuscript on Amazon and it costs you nothing. But if you are going to do this right, which is the only way that I can do this, uh, is you're going to have to invest in it like a publisher would. You're going to have to invest in your writing career like you would with a startup business. And we, I talked very briefly about this in the last episode about, you know, if you were starting a, a startup business, you would take out a business loan or you'd secure funding from someone or you'd borrow money from a friend or family member or you'd take some of your own savings if you're lucky enough to have them. And so that has been a, you know, something that has weighed on my mind. I've been like, okay, so if I spend X amount of pounds and we'll talk more about specific finances later. Um, this isn't the episode for it. But if I spend X amount of pounds 
on my book and I don't see the return on it, which is always a risk, isn't it? You might not sell as many copies of your book as you, you hope to or um, get an, you know any other income associated with writing that would make up for that money. And you start thinking things like, so <laughs> when when my kids are older and they, you know, if they need money for a car or the, uh, a deposit for a house or want to go to university and you have to pay for things there if or if they want to get married or all these things. And I'm, I'm spending money that should, you know, go towards them on, on, on those things. And you start getting yourself into these circles of doubt and you start thinking, oh, am I a good parent? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about myself here and not them, I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's so, so hard. And uh, as I say, I've had circles of those uh, bouts of self-doubt for, for a, a while since I decided it. But they are slowly quieting because one thing that I know in this is hopefully something that might ease some of your own doubts if you have similar ones, is that you have to also take care of yourself in life in order to be the best parent or person to other significant people in your life. And it's like the old adage, you know, you put on your own oxygen mask before you help others. And th that's a little bit how it feels for me. If I, if I do this for myself, I will be happier. I'll be more content. I will be pursuing something that gives me a deep sense of completeness in, in the writing side of things, in my creative side. And that, in turn, will stop my overthinking and my worry and my anxiety and my constant self beration about how you know, I'm not good enough to get a, a book published and, and such things like that which are, are thoughts which regularly run through my mind and possibly run through yours too. You're, you're possibly in a similar position to me. And so you get to that stage and you eventually say, well, yeah, I need to sort myself out. And, and if I'm happier, then I'm going to be a better parent to my child. I'm going to have more time for them. And although that sounds a bit contradictory because self-publishing involves so much more work, but actually it's time is one of those things we actually have more of than we ever think we do and um, been listening to some some podcasts on different philosophical things and one of them's about time and how you use it and it's sort of changed my per perspective on that a little bit and I definitely have more I sometimes say to people I've got no time I'm so busy blah blah, blah. and actually when I sat and rat, wrote down everything that I'm doing in, with my time you have more of it than you think you do and this is, if you sit and do this and write down what you do every day for a week, and then look back at it and say, is there any way I can fit in, you know, an extra hour or two for X, Y, Z? There is. There are things that you don't have to be doing with that time. There is moments where you are just sitting on the couch or you're you're sitting somewhere and and you're not being, you know, you're not doing something you have to be doing. So you always find pockets of time that you could better utilize. And that's, you know, if I'm happier. And not thinking about those other things, I can be 100% in the moment with my kids. I can find more pockets of time to spend uh, with them and do things with them and play with them and do all the things that I want to do as a, a good dad, as a better dad. Because um, I, I, I do always want to be better. I sometimes um, sit and think, and if you're a parent, you probably think this too, that oh, I'm not doing enough because I'm doing X, Y, Z selfish thing. And yeah, it's, that is a hard balance to get. But I think if you... If you have, it's, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, isn't it? And you have to you have to make sure you've got all the things that you need to survive as an individual before you can then be there for others. And that's what I'm hoping that this particular decision will, will allow for my, my family life. The next thing that I noted down that I wanted to very briefly touch on was was about friends. Now, I have writing friends. I have so many writing friends. I'm, I'm really lucky in that regard who all understand this and they get it all. And I talk to them lots um, in emails and DMs and over in the Right Method Hub and, and other places um, and, um, you know, in a few Facebook groups, etc. So there's there's lots of um, places where I can lean on the writer friend support. But my, my in real life IRL friends, I... I've not been as good. I've got to be honest, in the last couple of years at keeping up with them and so on. And I just, like... I know that they know I've I've enjoyed writing, I've written books and so on. But when someone's not a writer, they sometimes just assume, oh, you've written and finished the book, so where can I buy that now, please? And they assume it's just going to be published straight away. And of course, we all know, we've probably even had that conversation with people. 
but it's not as simple as that and, and people who are not writers don't get that necessarily so when I maybe you know I invite them and say oh do you want to come to my, my book launch or whatever um, it might feel a bit strange they might be oh you know published years and years ago what you know what's taking you so long why have you uh, been what have you been doing the last decade <laughs> and, uh, and and other such things like that so um, that's something I'm a wee bit nervous about as well because uh as I say, my, my friends, most of them are from rugby or university or whatever, and I know them from different circles. And so it may, it will be difficult, perhaps. Um, and maybe this is a self, this is a self thing and they, they probably won't even think anything like this, but I think it might be uh, difficult to sort of explain how this has all come about. And, and again, they might be like, well, why didn't you just self publish 10 years ago and um, whatever else? So yeah, there's, there's a lot of complexity to, to informing friends as well. The next note I put down actually was about finance, but we've already kind of touched on that today and, you know, investing in your writing career like a business and spending the money that you need to spend to make it as good as it can be. For me, the the way I view that um, without getting into specifics is this. I want this book, the thing that is going to be out there potentially, you know, indefinitely, certainly probably beyond my, my, own, my own lifespan. Um, I want it to be as good as it can be. And I want to make sure that um, when yeah, when I'm not around that people can read it and, and still think, oh, that's a good book, he's a good writer and so on. Uh, but also I, I want people now to read it and think, well, oh, that's a great story. And uh, as, you know, as told uh, to, to a very high professional standard, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have um, known any different between whether it's been self-published or traditionally published or that kind of thing and you know and the same goes for every element of the of the process from the the cover to the editing to um the marketing the publicity and everything else that goes with um producing releasing launching uh publicizing a book and, and so on and and that's that's my great hope for it and so if that involves investing money in it the way i figure it is this and it's easy to say when you have money and i know how difficult it is to not have money because I've been um, sat in the in the job centre um, a couple of times in my life and um, been told I'm not eligible for job seekers allowance and um, other benefits and so on. And I know how difficult it is to have um, no money. And I've had I've, before I became a teacher, I had very low paid jobs as well where you, you're struggling to live off of. So I understand that when when I say about it, you have to invest, and some people might not be in that position. I can understand how much it might sound like it's a it's from a privileged point of view but um I, i'm looking at it more from a, a personal point of view and this is only for me and not for everyone but i have to make sure it's done right and and, and you know and that obviously involves putting a bit of money into it um and i'll we'll discuss we'll, I'll, I'll give you a breakdown of some of my finances when i get closer to the to the end product and um, which will be in a couple of months and will be a few episodes down the line the next thing on my, my little list of notes to discuss today is about time and time running out. And I, I, I briefly touched on it earlier on, um, incidentally, but I do get this sense of a ticking clock with my life. I do this all the time. It's not healthy, and maybe some of you guys do this too. But I think I need to have done X, Y, Z by the time I'm 40. I need to done uh abc by the time i'm 50 and and so on and i, I start putting uh, ages and time limits on the, on the things i need to achieve in life and i know logically the thing to do is not to do that that people achieve great things in their own time and sometimes it happens later in life and all the rest of the the bits of advice and sayings that that people can give you and and get and distribute but for me, I, I've had that that voice in my head for the last few years, and um, because I'm I'm approaching a, a landmark age of um, of forty, um, I don't know if I've ever told or really discussed my age with people before, but yes, uh, it's it's creeping over the hill now. Uh, it's looming large, and uh, it, it does make you sort of evaluate what you've achieved and what you haven't, and so on. Um, and you know, <laughs> I'm certainly not getting any younger. You. You know, you probably see that from uh, my videos, my first right mentor videos of a few years ago compared to now. Uh, but I do want to 
yeah, achieve certain things by certain dates and so on. And it, it's all arbitrary, isn't it? It's all in our own head, and um, it's it's not that you have to have certain things done. And that's where I don't particularly like things like you know the uh, thirty under thirty or you know m- m- greatest people under forty that have achieved you know X Y Z blah all these kind of things you see in magazines and clickbaity websites and all these kind of things and you think oh you know like and you, and you look at these young people who have achieved more in their 10 years of working than you might in, in 40 but anyway the, these kind of things obviously don't help and you get all these thoughts in your head but I'm trying to quieten those by just taking control and getting on with what I want to achieve and it, it certainly does help I've noticed that those voices have certainly become quieter uh, the more I just I'm doing the work and getting closer towards uh, my end goal and what I want to achieve. So that's a, a wee tip for you if if you do have those similar voices, um, just just doing stuff, working towards things, is enough to quieten those a little bit. And and if you don't want to go down self publishing route, which is not for everyone, and you're you're wanting to hold out for trad, that doesn't mean to say that you you're treading water. If you know if you're not doing anything the key thing about that is uh, continue developing craft keep learning new things keep reading a wide variety of books and getting better sharing your work putting it out there and all the things that you you can actually do even if you can't control the subjective tastes of the the people who decide which manuscripts will be published and which won't so yes taking uh, control and power certainly does help with those particular voices um, the next note I've got is about ego and confidence. Oh, that's that's a good one. Um, it's my contention, I've said this before, that in order to be an author and want to write for young people and to think that you are someone who can do that and you're the right person to do that as well, there needs to be a degree of ego about you. Um, and, and some people say, oh, I'm totally devoid of ego and so on and so on. I don't think in, in what we do that can be entirely the case. That's just my opinion on it. Confidence is another thing. Um, a lot of years of uh, getting rejections and uh, been told, no, not this time, not this time, not this time, no thanks, etc., cetera, uh, can really dent confidence. And we talked a little bit about the, the uh, confidence knowledge curve a little bit earlier on, but it certainly it has been creeping up for me um, over the last year or two. But... I have noticed an exponential increase in just my overall confidence since I've made this decision and I've been working away behind the scenes. And I wonder if confidence, in a way, is just related to how much you you get on and do things. I think often when I'm at my least confident, it's because I'm not doing things. And I know that sounds very simplistic. It's a, it has a very simplistic way of looking at it, but... When I, when I do things, I feel more confident. When I don't do things, I feel less confident. Take, for example, I, I'm going back to school uh, this week and I haven't uh, taught for, what, six, six seven weeks uh, so the last time I took a class and my confidence is definitely a little bit lower about taking my lessons than it was at the end of last term when I was doing it every day, five or six times a day for you know the best part of 10 months. And... And that's that's I think there's something in that confidence grows with doing things, and just sometimes um, you just have to do things, even if you're not feeling 100 percent confident with them. And that extends to to writing, to putting your work out there, um, and obviously making big decisions like the one that I have as well. So, talking about confidence, the next thing to discuss is when you're a self-published author, you have to do a lot of the communication and the asking yourself as far as I I, I know and this is based upon the experience of friends who have been in this position when you are with a traditional publisher quite a lot of things get asked for you they get done for you Uh, you, you're informed of it and you're told of it but you know they're driving the production of the book obviously with self-publishing you're the driver and uh, interestingly I put out a thing on Twitter uh, a couple of weeks ago now and said who would be your dream cover quote uh, author and interestingly a couple of people said oh uh, I I am always too nervous to ask people and this is traditionally published people and, and I thought oh that's strange 
why is your publisher not asking people or um, have they asked people and they've said no or why are they not pushing it and so on and it made me think well actually am I in much of a worse position than someone who's traditionally published if they're having to ask writing friends themselves anyway then you know what what's what's the difference you know between me asking a writing friend to do it and someone with a trad publisher having to do it and so on and so actually I don't think I'm at too much of a disadvantage in terms of this and the one thing I've learned with the work I've done with Write Mentor over the last five years is that in general when you ask people to do something they will mostly say yes if they say no it's because they they don't have time to do it that it's not enough money or they just don't fancy it but generally speaking that's on the the minimal end in terms of the number of negative responses you get and so and and also what is the worst thing that someone can say when you ask them to do something they might say no they might say well i'll see if i get around to it and they'll say well i'll do it but no promises etc and the worst thing that happens is it doesn't get done and so i've been thinking about this you know i need to ask people for a cover quote um and and i've actually i've asked a couple of close friends who um i've I've talked to about this book actually before i I told anyone else that i was doing it um and 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 they were delighted to do it they were happy to do it which is nice um i'm thinking about as well like my, my friend sally says oh you should get someone to do a cover reveal um she said she got uh, joe clark to do it who who does a lot of cover reveals and so that that's something also which is on um my to-do list i need to ask someone to do a reveal um for, for a while i thought oh, i'll just reveal it myself but the, the, again that's there's something quite nice isn't there about someone else revealing your cover and i've seen other people doing it for fellow writer friends or you know etc etc uh, book bloggers doing it for on behalf of other people um online and it's, it's quite a nice thing to do i think and I, i'd imagine if someone asked me to do it for them i would always say yeah i'd, I'd love that I'd, you know if, if you know as someone who I know well, obviously. And so, yeah, I, I think try to lose that, that feeling of being a fraud or because you're having to ask yourself that that's somehow wrong, it turns out that almost everyone's doing that anyway. I mean, maybe if you're a big hitter, you're not necessarily having to get cover blurbs because people know your books and they'll buy them anyway. Or uh, you, you your publisher, if you're a big hitter, maybe is doing a lot of this work on your behalf. But um, it's, it, was, it was interesting to find out that even trad published authors were still doing a lot of the asking themselves. So try not to feel like a fraud if you're either already down this path or consider going down it. Um, it happens to the very, very best in the industry as well. Uh, the other thing I, I was considering as well, and again, this, all of this dr- drives into maybe a, a degree of the imposter syndrome about doing this, but um, will I ever get my book into shops? And luckily, I know from uh, the experience of a few friends that you can get your book into shops. Uh, it obviously involves tons more work from you uh, than if you're traditionally published, but it's, it is possible to do. Um, and the the other thing I was thinking about as well is and just because I've seen a few uh, things about awards recently. Obviously, if you decide to be a self-published author, you're not going to be eligible for a lot of the main awards, regardless of how good your book is. And you know whether people think that's fair or not or whatever, uh, that's a different discussion to be had and certainly not one for someone like me to, to discuss. But um, that got me thinking. I was like, oh, yeah, of course, that, that is one thing you miss out on. You know, you, you, your books might not be in any shops or certainly not all shops. Uh, you, you won't get put up or nominated for um, some of the children's books awards although again you know a few of them have disappeared this year so it might be less relevant going forward and, and the last one um, which is maybe even the most relevant for me is respect from uh, peers and other authors who are traditionally published and that's a uh, I, I think this is one of those things that probably ruminates in our own heads far more than it ruminates in the heads of our peers and it's probably something that you know how that thing where you think someone's talking about you or they think X, Y, Z about you or you think, oh, I've made a fool of myself. They're going to be laughing about me for days. They're going to be talking about me. They're going to be telling everyone that, you know, how much of a, a fraud I am or how much of a fool I've made of myself. And in actuality, they have forgotten all about you 
within about two minutes of your conversation. And it's, it's interesting that because you can turn yourself in circles, get yourself in a big twist, because I was talking about earlier on, because you think people are thinking about you and what they're thinking about you and that it might not be too positive. But in reality, they're probably not thinking about you. And so for for anyone listening out there who thinks, oh, well, I get the respect from my peers. It, honestly, I, I don't think people think about it enough for that to be a significant uh, drawback or issue with going down the, the self-publishing route. And that's the way certainly I'm looking at it in my, my own head as well. And actually, if I don't allow those thoughts to get into my head, they're not going to come from anyone else. Nobody's going to say out loud, you're a fraud because you're self-published. Uh, and if they do, then that's that's a, a quick block and don't speak to that person again, I think. So, yes, um, don't worry too much about the awards, respect from peers thing. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. The shops thing, getting your book into shops is something you can do about and with hard work and uh, getting in touch with people and, you know, offering to nip into shops maybe and, and do X, Y, Z. That's, that's certainly a way that um, you can get a bit of parity with those who are traditionally published. Although, again, in saying that, you know, traditionally published doesn't mean to say you're in all shops either. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind, too, when you're thinking about it. Okay, um, the next thing I put in my, my notes was, is there an element of proving myself after all the rejections? A uh, quick answer is yes, I think so. I uh, People see me as the rejection guy, quite rightly. I have had a lot of them, and I've talked a lot about it. Uh, so that's fine. But part of what I want to do with this project and uh, publishing my book is to try and invert those um, those images that have been projected onto me, perhaps, you know, painted a lot by myself, but also I think um, others have, I probably think it as well now. And so I'm trying to maybe, yeah, invert that perspective and go from maybe being the rejection guy to... To something else um, and that's that's something that there's definitely an element of it you know and improve myself but by, by that as well I, I mean can I get um, a lot of kids to read my book and enjoy it that, that is what I mean by proving myself uh, because with all the rejections you do start doubting and stay, saying well actually is my work suitable for kids you know if, if all these people all these agents and so on are saying it's it's not it's not for me and and they're always kind about it. I know that I know it's subjective, and it's about whether they can sell it or not. And it's not there's no personal um, malice in, in any rejection that you get, but it, it does get you down and start questioning yourself. And so a part of it is about wanting to see well, actually, if I get it out there myself, can I get kids to read it and can I get kids to enjoy it? And that's what I'm I'm aiming to prove with the particular project that I'm doing. Now on to the last wee bit of the the podcast for today i was wanting to talk a little bit about what i've been up to and, and behind the scenes because this this has you know although i only announced this a couple of weeks ago it's been going on for a number of months now all the planning behind the scenes and so on and i'm at quite exciting stages on a number of fronts the the first one is to talk about uh, cover stuff and some illustrations and so on now i talked a little bit about investing earlier on this is an area you definitely if if you've got money to invest, this is one of the areas you should definitely put money into. Find a great cover illustrator if you're writing middle grade or cover designer for YA um, and obviously illustrator for younger as well for chapter books, etc. And make sure that uh, you're both happy with the, the vision and design and so on of what you want. And then make sure that you pick someone who is going to deliver or has got exemplification of things that you can envisage on your own cover and and I, and I have been really really lucky I put a shout out God, it must have been the start of this year at some point for an illustrator and I got a lot of offers which was lovely but I was looking through a lot of the portfolios of people and you look at the style and you think you know what this person is really talented they're so good but that style isn't right for what I want and and I did a, a bit of that and I was just lucky that one of the people who responded to my post on the SCBWI uh, Facebook page was was perfect in, in my eyes anyway in terms of what I was looking for in terms of the design. And uh, I signed up with her via her illust illustration agent. Uh, and 
uh, she's she's working on the cover and some individual illustrations for the 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 book and for marketing etc as well so that has been very exciting and i've seen um i've seen obviously the rough sketches from quite a while ago um i have seen the the more progressed sketches as well i've seen uh sort of design for the cover and so on. It's, it's really exciting and nice and this is one of the biggest draws for me in terms of doing this process and going with self-publishing is the amount of uh, creative control I've had is unbelievable. Um, to be fair, the illustrator herself has been has been brilliant to work with. She has been very communicative. She's run everything past me. And um, in return, I've tried not to be too much of a, a, a controlling diva about it all. But uh, it's come along nicely. And, and I think we're both happy with how things are going. And um, I cannot wait until the day when I get to do the cover reveal. That's a very exciting day um, that, that you have in the the horizon if you go down this route and yeah i'm really looking forward to that um I'll, I'll, I'll try and get her on actually for for an episode and see if she's happy to chat about the process um and and give you give you some hints and tips in terms of finding an illustrator working with one and so on um in a, in a future episode because i think that'd be quite nice um and i'll maybe see if i can get permission to to share a few of the things that she's drawn for me and so on as well and we can pop that on the on the youtube video for that particular episode and maybe uh, put some some wee thumbnails below the the podcast edition uh, if you're listening to audio only so yeah that's that's something that's happening which is quite exciting behind the scenes uh, so i'll share more about that when uh, it's further down the line it's progressed uh, developmental edits are still on the go it's it's a bit of a slog uh, the 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 plan is obviously to make sure that my, my book is as tight and as strong as it can be. And so I will be going through developmental edits and then line edits, copy edits, proofs, and, and every stage that a book would normally go through with a traditional publisher. And I'm hoping that the result of that will be that um, we get a, a good sort of tight, uh, fast paced, but also deep and uh, emotionally laced story, which, which kids enjoy and they'll recommend to their friends and so on that that's what i really want um and obviously i'll be putting in all the effort over the next few months and, and on the editing front as well i don't think that will particularly stop uh between now and, and january i think I'll, I'll be constantly working on that just to make it the very best it can be um, and i'm also trying to work on another wee project on the side you know as a, a break from this and um, to, to give myself a bit of fun too and i think that's important and it's one thing I've noticed over the last few months is I've, I've been, I'm an all or nothing guy. So I, I do completely absorb myself in the self-publishing things that I'm doing, but it's important to have something else to to do. You know, like if I've got a spare 45 minutes at some point and I don't really have time to get into the, the big picture stuff for my publishing project. Uh, it's quite nice to to sit and, and get into another project that I'm working on. So um, and do, working a bit on that work in progress. So yeah, anyway. I have been doing that alongside the edits. Uh, I signed up for a self-publishing course again yesterday. Uh, it's my, my fourth one that I've signed up for. And I really do recommend these if you've got the means to do it. And a few of the ones I've signed up for as well are super cheap. And one of them has a concession rate as well. And there's also alternatives to courses if, if that's too much, such as uh, e-books on self-publishing, which... I've read a few of as well and, and are very good. So that's a, a, a cost-effective way of learning more about the process. But I like the courses because you get to interact with other people in the course who are going through you know, a similar experience and you can chat about, you know, what did you do here? What would you do here? Et cetera, et cetera. You've got uh, course tutors who have all self-published and have gone through all this um, several times with several books and so have answers to most questions. And also, the, of course, like things like, directed notes and videos which show you and instruct you on how to do all the various aspects that are involved so I, I really do think it's important to keep learning keep developing and I would hope that you know I'll, I'll do my very best with this first book but as you know I continue to bring out books over the years to come that I'll continue to keep learning and developing and not doing things the same way as I did it the last time uh, just for ease I'm hoping that I'll learn from the previous experience and maybe do and tweak things or do things differently if I have to um, and, and get, you know, the, the, the process as finely polished and effective as, as possible. 
So that that's the, the plan. Keep learning, keep developing, and keep on um, churning out material so that you've got the, the next book as well. And the last thing I've been working on is, as you know, I'm a teacher, so I've been working on some uh, cross-curricular uh, schemes of learning for, for late primary, early secondary schools, which is the sort of 8 to 12 age range, I'm thinking, from a book, uh, and looking at how we can integrate English and science together, looking at like STEM projects that um, obviously relate to, to my book, um, looking at uh, PSHE and health aspects of the curriculum and so on. Um, and, and as I say, as a teacher, I'm, I'm able to, to write schemes of learning which um, fall broadly in line with the, the learning outcomes and so on that uh, teachers have to follow within schools. So I'm, I'm trying to develop those as well as I go and, and so hopefully have them ready for when the, the book comes out. Because I think, um, as I, I know as a teacher, like and I know the English teachers in my school, for example, they don't have tons of planning time because they, especially in English, they, they do so much more marking than they do in a lot of other subjects. It's a lot more text and reading and marking heavy and so anything you can do for them or for the primary teachers who again are, are very uh, marking intensive in their role anything you can do to reduce planning time for them is going to be a real time saver and it might it might um, be something that's helpful for them and may, maybe convince them to to include your book and to use your book um, and if you know even if they don't and they just use the the ideas and learning activities and so on in the schemes of learning which you know i'd probably stick in my my website as, as free to download then that's still good as well that's positive you know I'm, I'm i'm an educator i want kids to learn more about stem subjects and and science and and health these are these are important to me as a, a biology teacher so that is um that's a, a positive aspect and, and another thing that i'm working on inside as well so it's quite a lot, as as you can probably gather from what I'm doing. And and not, and and one thing I would say is that some of these things aren't something that you have to do or even should do. I am simply doing them because uh, my personality means that I cannot not do everything. I have to do it all, um, or I would not do anything. I suspect. So that's why I've uh, I've also included that too, and I've been working on that for the last while. So that is what I've been up to. We've discussed quite a lot today, tonight. Um, I'm, I'm recording this in the evening. Uh, we've discussed the making the decision, uh, honesty and dishonesty, and being completely uh, transparent and true when you're discussing things. Uh, a lot of the emotional things that how it's, the decisions have affected um, other aspects of my life, like family and finance and friends. And uh, we've talked about ticking clocks and time running out and getting things done by a certain age and ego and confidence. Uh, being a fraud and asking people to do various things and things like awards, getting into bookshops, respect from peers, as well as an element of why are we doing this? Do we want to prove something? What is what is a point that we're trying to prove with doing all of this? So there, there was a lot packed into this episode and I hope you have enjoyed listening. I hope that when you, when you do listen as well, that it fills you with some hope and encouragement that it gives you some ideas and maybe makes you think well actually this is possible for me because as i said at the start it's not it's not a one horse race this uh, it's not like we're not against each other we can we can all just canter along beside each other it's not about getting to the you know the finish line first and winning uh, we can you know go alongside each other chat away share share ideas and news and um i think that that is definitely the way to go and that's the purpose of the podcast so if you have learned something or taken something from it or just enjoyed listening uh, to to my particular journey and project then i would love it if you got in touch and just uh, told me so or um you know mentioned it to a friend recommended it to a friend or or you know did something um i, I really do appreciate when people do that and um as i say in the first two episodes i got loads and loads of those and it was really really nice so uh, please, please do keep sending me them, and uh, you know if you can do anything else to support the project, like uh, retweeting my my various things or signing up to my newsletter, that's that's a great way to support because it means that you're going to get uh, all of my latest news uh, firsthand each month, and I'll be able to include you in the giveaways and other things that I've got coming up just for my newsletter peeps as well. So uh, yeah, do sign up for the newsletter. My 
uh, link for that is in my Twitter bio in the link tree there. So if you click that, it'll take you to the newsletter sign up and I can email you directly into your inbox every month with updates too. Okay, so that brings us to the end of episode three of the 1100 project. Um, I've been Stuart and it's been lovely to, to talk to you all and I hope you have enjoyed listening. I'll see you next time.